back to the show today. We are talking about what the hell happened to the Los Angeles Clippers. This is one of the most interesting stories in the NBA over the last 10 years, in my opinion. If you're not super knowledgeable about the NBA, this is the story about how the ninth richest man in the world bought an NBA team, and then acquired two of the biggest stars in the NBA, and then consistently under-delivered over the course of the next five years. This team was not an abject failure, though, from a professional sports perspective. But given the expectations of the team, and the slow burn of disappointment that Clippers fans experience, it makes it particularly compelling and sad. So the Clippers started this new era of the team in 2019 by signing and trading for these two aforementioned star players, as opposed to the alternative route of building a team through the NBA draft. Not that signing star players or trading for star players is a bad thing, or some type of cheat code, or just a shortcut to getting a good team. It's just something that Steve Ballmer could literally afford to do since he's a hundred times richer than the average NBA owner. But I have to say, when Steve Ballmer bought the team, he didn't just come in and start spending loads of money right away, like some new money NBA owners do. Ballmer meticulously dismantled his team over the course of four years in order to rebuild his team fresh. And when I say Steve Ballmer, I mean the executives of the Clippers organization and Steve Ballmer. They've had a lot of different front office people in there over the years. And the only real consistent decision maker was Steve Ballmer. So for the sake of this video, Steve Ballmer is entirely responsible for every single decision the Clippers made. Just trying to keep it simple, you all know it's not really true. All the decisions were made by a committee of people. So Ballmer took on the team in 2014 and he shipped out Chris Paul in 2017. He got back a slew of players and a couple draft picks. Same thing with Blake Griffin, he traded him before the deadline that year. He sent him to the Pistons for basically the same thing. A bunch of players who we're going to talk about and then a bunch of draft picks as well. This was a really smart move and very future thinking. The Clippers were at the end of the Lob City era, they were just done. The team was not good enough to make it past the Warriors, the Spurs, or the Oklahoma City Thunder. Unfortunately, Blake Griffin was not able to appreciate the business decision of him being traded. Blake Griffin had just signed a five-year extension with the Clippers. Apparently, Steve Ballmer had told him he wanted him to be a Clipper for life, which, if it really did happen, is very manipulative. But I gotta say, even though it is a cold-hearted business decision to move on from Blake Griffin, it was an incredibly smart move. Blake Griffin had one or two great seasons left in the tank, but he didn't have five. And the assets they got back from Blake Griffin strengthened that team. Unfortunately, it weakened the relationship between Blake Griffin and Steve Ballmer. About the situation still being icy, that's the owner of the Clippers, Steve Ballmer, looking to shake hands and exchange pleasantries with Blake Griffin after his pregame warm-up. Blake wanted no parts of it. That was a video of Blake Griffin ignoring Steve Ballmer's handshake. There's a great interview from the Graham Benzinger show where Blake Griffin talks about this. And how he was kept out of the loop that he was being traded and he had to find out via tweet. Blake is really mature when he's telling this story, but this happens all the time. Players are just traded with no warrant or transparency on any of the front office decisions. I guess this is because if anything does go wrong in the negotiation of the deal, you wouldn't want the player to know that he was on the chopping block and that he was in trade negotiations. He might feel a bit salty about that or just like he's not valued in the organization, even though that's not necessarily true. In my opinion though, these are grown men. Sure, they're not gonna react well when they hear the news that their team is trying to trade them, but they're gonna get over it. Eventually, they're gonna appreciate the fact that you were honest with them and you weren't trying to deceive them. People are capable of getting past most things, but not being lied to. You're a person, you know. All right, so Steve Ballmer cashes out on Chris Paul and Blake Griffin. He's doing all right. He's still got a good team though. He's got Pat Bev, Lou Will, Montrez Harrell, Danilo Gallinari, all these dudes. He's also able to trade Boban and Tobias Harris to the Philadelphia 76. Sixers. In exchange for draft picks, Bomber was sort of killing it. He was doing a really good job. He gained a bunch of draft capital and kept a decent team. I loved this era of the Clippers, by the way. There were no stars on this team, but the chemistry of this team was a mess. In 2019, they matched up against the Golden State Warriors in the first round of the playoffs, like the KD and Steph Warriors. And they got two games on, them, including a 31-point comeback. That comeback in game two was one of the most exciting games I've ever watched. This team was fun to watch. They had no superstars. Just glue guys, role players, and dogs. Also, Shea Gilgis Alexander was on that team. That comes in late. But after that season, the Clippers went in a completely different direction. Bomber got horny for stars. He was able to convince Kawhi Leonard to not re-sign with the Raptors, the team he just won a championship with. And he was only able to convince him to do this by acquiring Paul George in a trade from Oklahoma City. Apparently Kawhi wasn't going to sign with the Clippers unless they got Paul George as well. And the Clippers had to give up a lot for Paul George. They gave away five first round picks. Three of them were unprotected. Danilo Gallinari and SGA. Now everyone talks about this trade as if, oh, what if Shea had just stayed with the Clippers? 
Clippers, what would they have been? He'd probably be the exact player he is now, just on a different team. In extending this train of thought, you would think that Jalen Williams would be a Clipper as well, because he ended up being one of those picks that the Thunder got from the Clippers. The truth is, we have no idea what any alternate timeline would look like. I guess we have some idea SGA and Jalen Williams are good players, and we'd assume that they'd probably be good anywhere they went, regardless of any circumstance. But we don't know, so all we can do is judge this trade the way it was judged at the time it happened, which was seen as a big move, but a really good move for the Clippers. Now they had two All-NBA players on their team, and they maintain a lot of their core, a team that had been to the playoffs the year before. The Clippers became the favorites in the West. Mind you, the Lakers had just acquired AD that offseason as well. They still were the best team. This team didn't take a leap. They were an entirely new team with a different identity. They were the championship frontrunners. And there was definitely an expectation that this team was going to win at least one championship. I'm not overstating this, man. If you were an NBA fan in 2019, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So the Clippers did have a great season. They finished 49 and 23. Remember, the season was cut short. This was the bubble season. But the Clippers crumbled against the Denver Nuggets in the second round of the playoffs. The Clippers squandered a 3-1 to one lead. And that's where Playoff P adopted the new nickname. Well, I'm afraid to say it on this platform. I'm not trying to get any less views than I already do. So go look it up. You'll find it. So one mildly disappointing season. That happens. No big deal. Even Miami's Big 3 didn't win their first year. So the Clippers fired Doc Rivers and they promoted Ty Lue. That'll do the trick. Doc Rivers was the problem, of course. They should have fired Doc when Kawhi and Paul George got there. Doc always loses when he's up 3-1. What were we thinking? Well, turns out it wasn't necessarily all Doc's fault. Because the following year, after another pretty great season, the Clippers lost in the Western Conference Finals against the Suns. This is when the injury problems started flaring up for the Clippers. Kawhi went down in the second round of the playoffs. And it was up to Paul George entirely to take it from there. Which wasn't enough to get past that Suns team. It was a good team. Okay, so two very disappointing seasons. Bummer decided, hey, that's just bad luck. It was Doc Rivers' fault in 2020. It was the Kawhi injury in 2021. Steve Bomber doubles down on Kawhi and Paul George, extending both of their contracts for four more years. Max money. Which is something he had to do. These were two of the best players in the league. The Clippers had their bird rights. They could resign them and go over the salary cap. They had to do it. Any other GM would have done it too. So now the Clippers had at least three more chances at a championship. They missed on all of them. They never even made it back to the Western Conference Championship. So that Kawhi injury lasted for the entirety of the following season. He didn't play at all. The Clippers didn't even make the playoffs that year. And then the following season, they make the playoffs and they play the Suns in the first round. But now Paul George is injured and Kawhi gets injured in game two. It's just Russ out there. Needless to say, the Suns beat the Clippers. Another first round exit, dude. This sucks. So now Bomber and the rest of the executives are fed up. It's been four seasons and this team has been an embarrassment. Because keep in mind, for these four seasons, the Clippers have had the highest payroll in the league. Fluctuating up and down, but let's just say for the intents and purposes of this conversation, it's the most expensive payroll in the league. Not that it really matters. $170 million isn't that much money to Steve Bomber. His net worth is like $200 billion. Nevertheless, Bomber is starting to feel like a chump. He's starting to feel like he's being taken for a ride. He's paying these guys max money and they don't even play. He's probably thinking, hey, people told me these guys were the best in the business. Why does my team suck ass? So the summer hits and guess what? It's extension time. Paul George and Kawhi Leonard are expected to be offered a giant extension, probably four year maxes. They don't get those extensions that summer. Upper management lets Kawhi and Paul George squirm a little bit. Eventually, Kawhi does get a deal. He turns down his player option for the following season and signs a three year deal slightly below the max. I think this was a reasonable deal for both parties. Kawhi understands, yeah, I haven't really delivered on my past two contracts. I'll take a bit of a discount, that's fine. Plus, I don't think he wants to move to Orlando to get an extra $10 million a year. He's made enough money in his career, he wants to stay in SoCal where he's from. I get but it. But Paul George was not offered the same contract as Kawhi. Um, so the first initial deal was like two years, 60. Whoa, 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 whoa. Two years, 60? I'm not signing that, like, so I'm like, just give me what Kawhi got. Y'all view us the same, like, I'll take what Kawhi got. We were taking less. Kawhi took less. I was like, if Kawhi gonna take less, I'm not gonna say I want more than Kawhi. Like, I'm a Respect for Paul George for telling the story exactly how he experienced it. I really mean it. I think he really tells the story in an accurate way without a lot of resentment. So George was willing to take that pay cut that Kawhi got, but the Clippers didn't think he was worth that much money. And at that point, it was over. Paul George felt disrespected, and I can only imagine he lost his passion for the Clippers entirely. But keep in mind, this was only halfway through the season. He still had another six months or so of basketball. So I think last year, Klay Thompson and Paul George were in similar situations. Paul George with the Clippers and Klay Thompson with the Warriors. Both had felt disrespected by their organization. 
organizations and were completely emotionally detached. Their hearts weren't in it anymore. But they still had to play. And they had to play to prove that they were good enough for those future contracts they were going to get from different teams. So the playoffs come and the Clippers do make the fourth seed. They are a good team. Paul George and Kawhi have played all season. Things are looking good. But Kawhi gets hurt again. The Clippers get knocked out in the first round of the playoffs again by the hands of the Dallas Mavericks. And with that, the Kawhi, Paul George era of the Clippers finally died. Thank God. After five lackluster years that always started out so hopeful, it was finally over. Paul George opted out of the last year of his contract and he signed a four year max deal with the Philadelphia 76ers. Good for him. If they pay you for it, you're worth it. Remember that. The 76ers made a lot of really wise moves in order to create cap space to sign Paul George as a free agent. One being waiting to extend Tyrese Maxey so they could stay under the salary cap. Another one not extending James Harden to a huge max contract and then trading him for expiring contracts that would open up cap space this summer. Fittingly, James Harden ended up signing a $70 million deal with the Los Angeles Clippers. So currently, the Clippers are kind of in a limbo phase. They don't really know what direction they're going. They're not good, but they're definitely not bad. I think it's going to be good for them to just have a season that isn't as high pressure for once in five years. No one is expecting them to win the championship next year. They're just going to see what they've got and then next summer they can pick a direction. They got two big name players at least. People are going to come out to that new stadium and check them out. Maybe buy a James Harden jersey. I don't know. I'm not. I'm hopeful for the Clippers though. All in all, I don't think any executives at the Clippers ever made a bad decision necessarily. Every decision at the time felt tough but rational. Sometimes things just don't work out. Even though you do your due diligence. So I wouldn't call this era of the Clippers a failure. They didn't succeed, but I wouldn't call it a failure. Calling it a failure would be pretty dismissive of a lot of hard work from a lot of smart and passionate people. All right, thanks for being here. I know I didn't cover a lot of stuff. I didn't talk about Westbrook. I didn't talk about Harden. But for the narrative that I was talking about, they weren't really pertinent. Uh, so there's plenty of meat left on this bone. This was a recommendation. So if you have a recommendation for me, I might do it. Leave a comment. I reply to everything. Like the video if you like the video. If you didn't like the video, go ahead and dislike it. Be good to your mammies. Eat a corn dog.